Section one of the Vision of Sir Launfall and Other Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Vision of Sir Launfall and Other Poems by James Russell Lowell. A sketch of the life of James Russell Lowell. One Elmwood about half a mile from the craggy house in cambridge massachusetts on the road leading to the old town of watertown is elmwood a spacious square house set amongst lilac and syringa bushes and overtopped by elms pleasant fields are on either side and from the windows one may look out on the charles river winding its way among the marshes the house itself is one of a group which before the war for independence belonged to boston merchants and officers of the crown who refused to take the side of the revolutionary party tory row was the name given to the broad winding road on which the houses stood great farms and gardens were attached to them and some sign of their roomy ease still remains the estates fell into the hands of various persons after the war and in the process of time longfellow came to occupy craggy house elmwood at the time was the property of the rev charles lowell minister of the west church in boston and when longfellow thus became his neighbor james russell lowell was a junior in harvard college he was born at elmwood february twenty second eighteen nineteen any one who will read an indian summer reverie will discover how affectionately lowell dwelt on the scenes of nature and life amidst which he grew up indeed it would be a pleasant task to draw from the full storehouse of his poetry the golden phrases with which he characterizes the trees meadows brooks flowers birds and human companions that were so near to him in his youth and so vivid in his recollection in his prose works also a lively paper cambridge thirty years ago contains many reminiscences of his early life to know any one well it is needful to inquire into his ancestry and two or three hints may be given of the currents that met in this poet on his father's side he came from a succession of new england men who for the previous three generations had been in professional life the lowells trace their descent from percival lowell a name which survives in the family of bristol england who settled in newbury massachusetts in sixteen thirty nine the great-grandfather was a minister in newburyport one of those as dr hale says who preached sermons when young men went out to fight the french and preached sermons again in memory of their death when they had been slain in battle the grandfather was john lowell a member of the constitutional convention of massachusetts in seventeen eighty it was he who introduced into the bill of rights a phrase from the bill of rights of virginia all men are created free and equal with the purpose which it effected of setting free every man then held as a slave in massachusetts a son of john lowell and brother of the rev charles lowell was francis cabot lowell who gave a great impetus to new england manufactures and from whom the city of lowell took its name another son and thus also an uncle of the poet was john lowell jr whose wise and far-sighted provision gave to boston that powerful centre of intellectual influence the lowell institute of the rev charles lowell his son said in a letter written in eighteen forty four he is dr primrose in the comparative degree the very simplest and charmingest of sexagenarians and not without a great deal of the truest magnanimity it was characteristic of lowell thus to go to the vicar of wakefield for a portrait of his father dr lowell lived till eighteen sixty one when his son was forty-two mrs harriet spence lowell the poet's mother was of scotch origin a native of portsmouth new hampshire she is described as having a great memory an extraordinary aptitude for language and a passionate fondness for ancient songs and ballads it pleased her to fancy herself descended from the hero of one of the most famous ballads sir patrick spens and at any rate she made a genuine link in the poetic succession in a letter to his mother written in eighteen thirty seven lowell says i am engaged in several poetical effusions one of which i have dedicated to you 
who have always been the patron and encourager of my youthful muse the rustle in his name seems to intimate a strain of jewish ancestry at any rate lowell took pride in the name on this account for he was not slow to recognize the intellectual power of the hebrew race he was the youngest of a family of five two daughters and three sons an older brother who outlived him a short time was the rev robert trail spence lowell who wrote besides a novel the new priest in conception bay which contains a delightful study of a yankee some poems and a story of schoolboy life not long before his death lowell wrote to an english friend a description of elmwood and as he was very fond of the house in which he lived and died it is agreeable to read words which strove to set it before the eyes of one who had never seen it tis a pleasant old house just about twice as old as i am four miles from boston in what was once the country and is now a populous suburb but it still has some ten acres of open about it and some fine old trees when the worst comes to the worst if i live so long i shall still have four and a half acres left with the house the rest belonging to my brothers and sisters or their heirs it is a square house with four rooms on a floor like some houses of the georgian era i have seen in english provincial towns only they are of brick and this is of wood but it is solid with its heavy oaken beams the spaces between which in the four outer walls are filled in with brick though you mustn't fancy a brick and timber house for outwardly it is sheathed with wood inside there is much wainscot of deal painted white in the fashion of the time when it was built it is very sunny the sun rising so as to shine at an acute angle to be sure through the northern windows and going round the other three sides in the course of the day there is a pretty staircase with the quaint old twisted banisters which they call balusters now but mine are banisters my library occupies two rooms opening into each other by arches at the sides of the ample chimneys the trees i look out on are the earliest things i remember there you have me in my new old quarters but you must not fancy a large house rooms sixteen feet square and on the ground floor nine high it was large as things went here when it was built and has a certain air of amplitude about it as from some inward sense of dignity in an earlier letter he wrote here am i in my garret i slept here when i was a little curly-headed boy and used to see visions between me and the ceiling and dream the so often recurring dream of having the earth put into my hand like an orange in it i used to be shut up without a lamp my mother saying that none of her children should be afraid of the dark to hide my head under the pillow and then not be able to shut out the shapeless monsters that thronged around me minted in my brain in winter my view is a wide one taking in a part of boston i can see one long curve of the charles and the wide fields between me and cambridge and the flat marshes beyond the river smooth and silent with glittering snow as the spring advances and one after another of our trees puts forth the landscape is cut off from me piece by piece till by the end of may i am closeted in a cool and rustling privacy of leaves in two of his papers especially my garden acquaintance and a good word for winter has lowell given glimpses of the outdoor life in the midst of which he grew up two education his acquaintance with books and his schooling began early he learned his letters at a dame school mr william wells an englishman opened a classical school in one of the spacious tory row houses near elmwood and bringing with him english public school thoroughness and severity gave the boy a drilling in latin which he must have made almost a native speech to judge by the ease with which he handled it afterward in mock heroics of course he went to harvard college he lived at his father's house more than a mile away from the college yard but this could have been no great privation to him for he had the freedom of his friends rooms and he loved the open air the rev edward everett hale has given a sketch of their common life in college he was a little older than i he says and was one class in advance of me my older brother with whom i lived in college and he were the most intimate friends 
he had no room within the college walls and was a great deal with us the fashion of cambridge was then literary now the fashion of cambridge runs to social problems but then we were interested in literature we read byron and shelley and keats and we began to read tennyson and browning i first heard of tennyson from lowell who had borrowed from mr emerson the little first volume of tennyson we actually passed about tennyson's poems in manuscript carlyle's essays were being printed at the time and his french revolution in such a community not two hundred and fifty students all told literary effort was as i say the fashion and literary men among whom lowell was recognized from the very first were special favorites indeed there was that in him which made him a favorite everywhere lowell was but fifteen years old when he entered college in the class which graduated in eighteen thirty eight he was a reader as so many of his fellows were and the letters which he wrote shortly after leaving college show how intent he had been on making acquaintance with the best things in literature he began also to scribble verse and he wrote both poems and essays for college magazines his class chose him their poet for class day and he wrote his poem but he was careless about conforming to college regulations respecting attendance at morning prayers and for this was suspended from college the last term of his last year and not allowed to come back to read his poem i have heard in later years says dr hale what i did not know then that he rode down from concord in a canvas covered wagon and peeped out through the chinks of the wagon to see the dancing round the tree i fancy he received one or two visits from his friends in the wagon but in those times it would have been treason to speak of this he was sent to concord for his rustication and so passed a few weeks of his youth among scenes dear to every lover of american letters three the first venture after his graduation he set about the study of law and for a short time even was a clerk in a counting room but his bent was strongly towards literature there was at that time no magazine of commanding importance in america and young men were given to starting magazines with enthusiasm and very little other capital such a one was the boston miscellany launched by nathan hale lowell's college friend and for this lowell wrote gaily it lived a year and shortly after lowell himself with robert carter essayed the pioneer in eighteen forty three it lived just three months but in that time printed contributions by lowell hawthorne whittier story poe and dr parsons a group which it would be hard to match in any of the little magazines that hop across the world's path today lowell had already collected in eighteen forty one the poems which he had written and sometimes contributed to periodicals into a volume entitled a year's life but he retained very little of the contents in later editions of his poems the book has a special interest however from its dedication in veiled phrase to maria white he became engaged to this lady in the fall of eighteen forty and the next twelve years of his life were profoundly affected by her influence herself a poet of delicate power she brought into his life an intelligent sympathy with his work it was however her strong moral enthusiasm her lofty conception of purity and justice which kindled his spirit and gave force and direction to a character which was ready to respond and yet might otherwise have delayed active expression they were not married until eighteen forty four but they were not far apart in their homes and during these years lowell was making those early ventures in literature and first raids upon political and moral evil which foretold the direction of his later work and gave some hint of its abundance about the time of his marriage he published two books which by their character show pretty well the divided interest of his life his bent from the beginning was more decidedly literary than that of any contemporary american poet that is to say the history and art of literature divided his interest with the production of literature and he carried the unusual gift of a rare critical power joined to hearty spontaneous creation it may indeed be guessed that the keenness of judgment and incisiveness of wit which characterize his examination of literature sometimes interfered with his poetic power and made him liable to question his art when he would rather have expressed it unchecked 
one of the two books was a volume of poems the other was a prose work conversations on some of the old poets he did not keep this book alive but it is interesting as marking the enthusiasm of a young scholar treading away then almost wholly neglected in america and intimating a line of thought and study in which he afterward made most noteworthy venture another series of poems followed in eighteen forty eight and in the same year the vision of sir launfal perhaps it was in reaction from the marked sentiment of his poetry that he issued now a jeu d'esprit a fable for critics in which he hit off with a rough and ready wit the characteristics of the writers of the day not forgetting himself in these lines there is lowell who's striving parnassus to climb with a whole bale of isms tied together with rhyme he might get on alone spite of brambles and boulders but he can't with that bundle he has on his shoulders the top of the hill he will ne'er come nigh reaching till he learns the distinction twixt singing and preaching his lyre has some chords that would ring pretty well but he'd rather by half make a drum of the shell and rattle away till he's old as methuselah at the head of a march to the last new jerusalem this of course is but a half serious portrait of himself and it touches but a single feature others can say better that lowell's ardent nature showed itself in the series of satirical poems which made him famous the biglow papers written in a spirit of indignation and fine scorn when the mexican war was causing many americans to blush with shame at the use of the country by a class for its own ignoble ends lowell and his wife who brought a fervid anti-slavery temper as part of her marriage portion were both contributors to the liberty bell and lowell was a frequent contributor to the anti-slavery standard and was indeed for a while a corresponding editor in june eighteen forty six there appeared one day in the boston courier a letter from mr ezekiel biglow of jalam to the editor hon joseph t buckingham enclosing a poem of his son mr hosea biglow it was no new thing to seek to arrest the public attention with the vernacular applied to public affairs major jack downing and sam slick had been notable examples and they had many imitators but the reader who laughed over the racy narrative of the unlettered ezekiel and then took up hosea's poem and caught the gust of yankee wrath and humor blown fresh in his face knew that he was in at the appearance of something new in american literature the force which lowell displayed in these satires made his book at once a powerful ally of an anti-slavery sentiment which heretofore had been ridiculed four verse and prose a year in europe eighteen fifty one to eighteen fifty two with his wife whose health was then precarious stimulated his scholarly interests and gave substance to his study of dante and italian literature in october eighteen fifty three his wife died she had borne him three children the first-born blanche died in infancy the second walter also died young the third a daughter mrs burnett survived her parents in eighteen fifty five he was chosen successor to longfellow as smith professor of the french and spanish languages and literature and professor of belles lettres in harvard college he spent two years in europe in further preparation for the duties of his office and in eighteen fifty seven was again established in cambridge and installed in his academic chair he married also at this time miss frances dunlap of portland maine lowell was now in his thirty-ninth year as a scholar in his professional work he had acquired a versatile knowledge of the romance languages and was an adept in old french and provencal poetry he had given a course of twelve lectures on english poetry before the lowell institute in boston which had made a strong impression on the community and his work on a series of british poets in connection with professor child especially his biographical sketch of keats had been recognized as of a high order in poetry he had published the volumes already mentioned in general literature he had printed in magazines the papers which he afterward collected into his volume fireside travels not long after he entered on his college duties the atlantic monthly was started and the editorship given to him he held the office for a year or two only but he continued to write for the magazine 
and in eighteen sixty two he was associated with mr charles elliot norton in the conduct of the north american review and continued in this charge for ten years much of his prose was contributed to this periodical any one reading the titles of the papers which comprise the volumes of his prose writings will readily see how much literature and especially poetic literature occupied his attention shakespeare dryden lessing roseau dante spencer wordsworth milton keats carlyle percival thoreau swinburne chaucer emerson pope gray these are the principal subjects of his prose and the range of topics indicates the catholicity of his taste in these papers when studying poetry he was very alive to the personality of the poets and it was the strong interest in humanity which led lowell when he was most diligent in the pursuit of literature to apply himself also to history and politics several of his essays bear witness to this such as witchcraft new england two centuries ago a great public character josiah quincy abraham lincoln and his great political essays but the most remarkable of his writings of this order was the second series of the biglow papers published during the war for the union in these with the wit and fun of the earlier series there was mingled a deeper strain of feeling and a larger tone of patriotism the limitations of his style in these satires forbade the fullest expression of his thought and emotion but afterward in a succession of poems occasioned by the honors paid to student soldiers in cambridge the death of agassiz and the celebration of national anniversaries during the years eighteen seventy five and eighteen seventy six he sang in loftier more ardent strains the most famous of these poems was his noble commemoration ode five public life it was at the close of this period when he had done incalculable service to the republic that lowell was called on to represent the country first in madrid where he was sent in eighteen seventy seven and then in london to which he was transferred in eighteen eighty eight years were thus spent by him in the foreign service of the country he had a good knowledge of the spanish language and literature when he went to spain but he at once took pains to make his knowledge fuller and his accent more perfect so that he could have intimate relations with the best spanish men of the time in england he was at once a most welcome guest and was in great demand as a public speaker no one can read his dispatches from madrid and london without being struck by his sagacity his readiness in emergencies his interest in and quick perception of the political situation in the country where he was resident and his unerring knowledge as a man of the world above all he was through and through an american true to the principles which underlie american institutions his address on democracy which he delivered in england is one of the great statements of human liberty a few years later after his return to america he gave another address to his own countrymen on the place of the independent in politics it was a noble defense of his own position not without a trace of discouragement at the apparently sluggish movement in american self-government of recent years but with that faith in the substance of his countrymen which gave him the right to use words of honest warning the public life of mr lowell made him more of a figure before the world he received honors from societies and universities he was decorated by the highest honors which harvard could pay officially and oxford and cambridge st andrews and edinburgh and bologna gave gowns he established warm personal relations with englishmen and after his release from public office he made several visits to england there too was buried his wife who died in eighteen eighty five the closing years of his life in his own country though touched with domestic loneliness and diminished by growing physical infirmities that predicted his death were rich also with the continued expression of his large personality he delivered the public address in commemoration of the two hundred and fiftieth anniversary of the founding of harvard university he gave a course of lectures on the old english dramatists before the lowell institute he collected a volume of his poems he wrote and spoke on public affairs and the year before his death revised rearranged and carefully edited a definitive series of his writings in ten volumes 
he died at elmwood august twelfth eighteen ninety one since his death three small volumes have been added to his collected writings and mr norton has published letters of james russell lowell in two volumes end of section one Section 2 of The Vision of Sir Launfal and Other Poems by James Russell Lowell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schampf. Introductory Note Lowell was in his thirtieth year when he wrote and published The Vision of Sir Launfal. It appeared when he had just dashed off his Fable for Critics and when he was in the thick of the anti slavery fight writing poetry and prose for the anti-slavery standard and sending out his witty biglow papers he had married four years before and was living in the homestead at elmwood walking in the country about and full of eagerness at the prospect which lay before him in a letter to his friend charles f briggs written in december eighteen forty eight he says last night i walked to watertown over the snow with the new moon before me and a sky exactly like that in page's evening landscape orion was rising behind me and as i stood on the hill just before you enter the village the stillness of the fields around me was delicious broken only by the tinkle of a little brook which runs too swiftly for frost to catch it my picture of the brook in sir launfal was drawn from it but why do i send you this description like the bones of a chicken i had picked simply because i was so happy as i stood there and felt so sure of doing something that would justify my friends but why do i not say that i have done something i believe that i have done better than the world knows yet but the past seems so little compared with the future i am the first poet who has endeavored to express the american idea and i shall be popular by and by it is not very likely that lowell was thinking of sir launfal when he wrote this last sentence yet it is not straining language too far to say that when he took up an arthurian story he had a different attitude toward the whole cycle of legends from that of tennyson who had lately been reviving the legends for the pleasure of the english reading people the exuberance of the poet as he carols of june in the prelude to part first is an expression of the joyous spring which was in the veins of the young american glad in the sense of freedom and hope as tennyson threw into his retelling of arthurian romance a moral sense so lowell also a moralist in his poetic apprehension made a parable of his tale and in the broadest interpretation of democracy sang of the leveling of all ranks in a common divine humanity there is a subterranean passage connecting the biglow papers with sir launfal it is the holy zeal which attacks slavery issuing in this fable of a beautiful charity christ in the guise of a beggar the invention is a very simple one and appears to have been suggested by tennyson's sir galahad though lowell had no doubt read sir thomas mallory's mort d'arthur the following is the note which accompanied the vision when first published in eighteen forty eight and retained by lowell in all subsequent editions according to the mythology of the romancers the sangrio or holy grail was the cup out of which jesus christ partook of the last supper with his disciples it was brought into england by joseph of arimathea and remained there an object of pilgrimage and adoration for many years in the keeping of his lineal descendants it was incumbent upon those who had charge of it to be chaste in thought word and deed but one of the keepers having broken this condition the holy grail disappeared from that time it was a favorite enterprise of the knights of arthur's court to go in search of it sir galahad was at last successful in finding it as may be read in the seventeenth book of the romance of king arthur tennyson has made sir galahad the subject of one of the most exquisite of his poems the plot if i may give that name to anything so slight of the following poem is my own and to serve its purposes i have enlarged the circle of competition in search of the miraculous cup in such a manner as to include not only other persons than the heroes of the round table but also a period of time subsequent to the date of king arthur's reign end of section two
section three of the vision of sir launfall and other poems by james russell lowell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schampf. the vision of sir launfall prelude to part first over his keys the musing organist beginning doubtfully and far away first lets his fingers wander as they list and builds a bridge from dreamland for his lay then as the touch of his loved instrument gives hope and fervour nearer draws his theme first guessed by faint auroral flushes sent along the wavering vista of his dream not only around our infancy doth heaven with all its splendours lie daily with souls that cringe and plot we cyanize climb and know it not over our manhood bend the skies against our fallen and traitor lives the great winds utter prophecies with our faint hearts the mountain strives its arms outstretched the druid wood waits with its benedicity and to our ages drowsy blood still shouts the inspiring sea earth gets its price for what earth gives us the beggar is taxed for a corner to die in the priest hath his fee who comes and shrives us we bargain for the graves we lie in at the devil's booth are all things sold each ounce of dross costs its ounce of gold for a cap and bells our lives we pay bubbles we buy with a whole soul's tasking tis heaven alone that is given away tis only god may be had for the asking no price is set on the lavish summer june may be had by the poorest comer and what is so rare as a day in june then if ever come perfect days then heaven tries the earth if it be in tune and over it softly her warm ear lays whether we look or whether we listen we hear life murmur or see it glisten every clod feels a stir of might an instinct within it that reaches and towers and groping blindly above it for light climbs to a soul in grass and flowers the flush of life may well be seen thrilling back over hills and valleys the cowslip startles in meadows green the buttercup catches the sun in its chalice and there's never a leaf nor a blade too mean to be some happy creature's palace the little bird sits at his door in the sun a tilt like a blossom among the leaves and lets his illumined being o'errun with the deluge of summer it receives his mate feels the eggs beneath her wings and the heart in her dumb breast flutters and sings he sings to the wide world and she to her nest in the nice ear of nature which song is the best now is the high tide of the year and whatever of life hath ebbed away comes flooding back with a ripply cheer into every bare inlet and creek and bay now the heart is so full that a drop or fills it we are happy now because god wills it no matter how barren the past may have been it is enough for us now that the leaves are green we sit in the warm shade and feel right well how the sap creeps up and the blossoms swell we may shut our eyes but we cannot help knowing that skies are clear and grass is growing the breeze comes whispering in our ear that dandelions are blossoming near that maize has sprouted that streams are flowing that the river is bluer than the sky that the robin is plastering his house hard by and if the breeze kept the good news back for other couriers we should not lack we could guess it all by yon heifer's lowing and hark how clear and bold chanticleer warmed with the new wine of the year tells all in his lusty crowing joy comes grief goes we know not how everything is happy now everything is upward striving tis as easy now for the heart to be true as for grass to be green or skies to be blue tis the natural way of living who knows whither the clouds have fled in the unscarred heaven they leave no wake and the eyes forget the tears they have shed the heart forgets its sorrow and ache the soul partakes of the season's youth and the sulphurous rifts of passion and woe lie deep neath a silence pure and smooth like burnt-out craters healed with snow what wonder if sir launfall now remembered the keeping of his vow 
part first one my golden spurs now bring to me and bring to me my richest mail for to-morrow i go over land and sea in search of the holy grail shall never a bed for me be spread nor shall a pillow be under my head till i begin my vow to keep here on the rushes i will sleep and perchance there may come a vision true ere the day create the world anew slowly sir longfall's eyes grew dim slumber fell like a cloud on him and into his soul the vision flew two the crows flapped over by twos and threes in the pool drowsed the cattle up to their knees the little bird sang as if it were the one day of summer in all the year and the very leaves seemed to sing on the trees the castle alone in the landscape lay like an outpost of winter dull and gray twas the proudest hall in the north country and never its gates might open be save to lord or lady of high degree summer besieged it on every side but the churlish stone her assaults defied she could not scale the chilly wall though around it for leagues her pavilions tall stretched left and right over the hills and out of sight green and broad was every tent and out of each a murmur went till the breeze fell off at night three the drawbridge dropped with a surly clang and through the dark arch a charger sprang bearing sir longfall the maiden knight in his gilded mail that flamed so bright it seemed the dark castle had gathered all those shafts the fierce sun had shot over its wall in his siege of three hundred summers long and binding them all in one blazing sheaf had cast them forth so young and strong and lightsome as a locust leaf sir launfall flashed forth in his unscarred mail to seek in all climes for the holy grail four it was morning on hill and stream and tree and morning in the young knight's heart only the castle moodily rebuffed the gifts of the sunshine free and gloomed by itself apart the season brimmed all other things up full as the rain fills the pitcher plant's cup five as sir launfall made mourn through the darksome gate he was ware of a leper crouched by the same who begged with his hand and moaned as he sate and a loathing over sir launfall came the sunshine went out of his soul with a thrill the flesh neath his armour gan shrank and crawl and midway its leap his heart stood still like a frozen waterfall for this man so foul and bent of stature rasped harshly against his dainty nature and seemed the one blot on the summer morn so he tossed him a piece of gold in scorn six the leper raised not the gold from the dust better to me the poor man's crust better the blessing of the poor though i turn me empty from his door that is no true alms which the hand can hold he gives nothing but worthless gold who gives from a sense of duty but he who gives but a slender mite and gives to that which is out of sight that thread of all sustaining beauty which runs through all and doth all unite the hand cannot clasp the whole of his alms the heart outstretches its eager palms for a god goes with it and makes its store to the soul that was starving in darkness before prelude to part second down swept the chill wind from the mountain peak from the snow five thousand summers old on open wold and hilltop bleak it had gathered all the cold and whirled it like sleet on the wanderer's cheek it carried a shiver everywhere from the unleafed boughs and pastures bare the little brook heard it and built a roof neath which he could house him winter-proof all night by the white star's frosty gleams he groined his arches and matched his beams slender and clear were his crystal spars as the lashes of light that trim the stars he sculpted every summer delight in his halls and chambers out of sight sometimes his tinkering waters slipped down through a frost-leaved forest crypt 
long sparkling aisles of steel-stemmed trees bending to counterfeit a breeze sometimes the roof no fretwork knew but silvery mosses that downward grew sometimes it was carved in sharp relief with quaint arabesques of ice fern leaf sometimes it was simply smooth and clear for the gladness of heaven to shine through and here he had caught the nodding bulrush tops and hung them thickly with diamond drops that crystallized the beams of moon and sun and made a star of every one no mortal builder's most rare device could match this winter palace of ice twas as if every image that mirrored lay in his depths serene through the summer day each fleeting shadow of earth and sky lest the happy model should be lost had been mimicked in fairy masonry by the elfin builders of the frost within the hall are song and laughter the cheeks of christmas grow red and jolly and sprouting is every corbel and rafter with lightsome green of ivy and holly through the deep gulf of the chimney wide wallows the yule logs roaring tide the broad flame pennons droop and flap and belly and tug as a flag in the wind like a locust shrills the imprisoned sap hunted to death in its galleries blind the swift little troops of silent sparks now pausing now scattering away as in fear go threading the suit forest tangled darks like herds of startled deer but the wind without was eager and sharp of sir lonefall's gray hair it makes a harp and rattles and rings the icy strings singing in dreary monotone a christmas carol of its own whose burden still as he might guess was shelterless 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 the voice of the seneschal flared like a torch as he shouted the wanderer away from the porch and he sat in the gateway and saw all night the great hall fire so cheery and bold through the window slits of the castle old build out its piers of ruddy light against the drift of the cold part second one there was never a leaf on bush or tree the bare boughs rattled shudderingly the river was dumb and could not speak for the weaver winter its shroud had spun a single crow on the tree-top bleak from his shining feathers shed off the cold sun again it was morning but shrunk and cold as if her veins were sapless and old and she rose up decrepitly for a last dim look at earth and sea two sir launfall turned from his own hard gate for another heir in his earldom sate an old bent man worn out and frail he came back from seeking the holy grail little he recked of his earldom's loss no more on his surcoat was blazoned the cross but deep in his soul the sign he wore the badge of suffering and the poor three sir launfall's raiment thin and spare was idle mail gainst the barbed air for it was just at the christmas time so he mused as he sat of a sunnier clime and sought for a shelter from the cold and snow in the light and warmth of long ago he sees the snake-like caravan crawl o'er the edge of the desert black and small then nearer and nearer till one by one he can count the camels in the sun as over the red-hot sands they pass to where in its slender necklace of grass the little spring laughed and leapt in the shade and with its own self like an infant played and waved its signal of palms for for christ's sweet sake i beg an alms the happy camels may reach the spring but sir launfall sees only the gruesome thing the leper lank as the rain-blanched bone that cowers beside him a thing as lone and white as the ice isles of northern seas in the desolate horror of his disease five and sir launfall said i behold in thee an image of him who died on the tree thou also hast had thy crown of thorns thou hast had the world's buffets and scorns 
and to thy life were not denied the wounds in the hands and feet and side mild mary's son acknowledge me behold through him i give to thee six then the soul of the leper stood up in his eyes and looked at sir launfal and straightway he remembered in what a haughtier guise he had flung an alms to leprosy when he girt his young life up in gilded mail and set forth in search of the holy grail the heart within him was ashes and dust he parted in twain his single crust he broke the ice on the streamlet's brink and gave the leper to eat and drink twas a mouldy crust of coarse brown bread twas water out of a wooden bowl yet with fine wheaten bread was the leper fed and twas red wine he drank with his thirsty soul seven as sir launfal mused with a downcast face a light shone round about the place the leper no longer crouched at his side but stood before him glorified shining and tall and fair and straight as the pillar that stood by the beautiful gate himself the gate whereby men can enter the temple of god in man eight his words were shed softer than leaves from the pine and they fell on sir launfal as snows on the brine that mingle their softness and quiet in one with the shaggy unrest they float down upon and the voice that was calmer than silence said lo it is i be not afraid in many climes without avail thou hast spent thy life for the holy grail behold it is here this cup which thou didst fill at the streamlet for me but now this crust is my body broken for thee this water his blood that died on the tree the holy supper is kept indeed in whatso we share with another's need not what we give but what we share for the gift without the giver is bare who gives himself with his alms feeds three himself his hungering neighbour and me nine sir launfal awoke as from a swoon the grail in my castle here is found hang my idle armour up on the wall let it be the spider's banquet hall he must be fenced with stronger mail who would seek and find the holy grail Ten. the castle gate stands open now and the wanderer is welcome to the hall as the hangbird is to the elm tree bough no longer scowl the turrets tall the summer's long siege at last is o'er when the first poor outcast went in at the door she entered with him in disguise and mastered the fortress by surprise there is no spot she loves so well on ground she lingers and smiles there the whole year round the meanest serf on sir lanfal's land has hall and bower at his command and there's no poor man in the north country but is lord of the earldom as much as he end of section three Section 4 of The Vision of Sir Launfal and Other Poems by James Russell Lowell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Ode recited at the Harvard Commemoration. On the 21st of July, 1865, Harvard University welcomed back those of its students and graduates who had fought in the war for the Union by exercises in the church and at the festival which followed the services of the dead and the living were commemorated it was on this occasion that mr lowell recited the following ode one weak winged is song nor aims at that clear ethered height whither the brave deed climbs for light we seem to do them wrong bringing our robin's leaf to deck their hearse who in warm life blood wrote their nobler verse our trivial song to honour those who come with ears attuned to strenuous trump and drum and shaped in squadron strophes their desire live battle odes whose lines were steel and fire yet sometimes feathered words are strong a gracious memory to buoy up and save from lethe's dreamless ooze the common grave of the unventurous throng two 
today our reverend mother welcomes back her wisest scholars those who understood the deeper teaching of her mystic tome and offered their fresh lives to make it good no lore of greece or rome no science peddling with the names of things or reading stars to find inglorious fates can lift our life with wings far from death's idle gulf that for the many waits and lengthen out our dates with that clear fame whose memory sings in manly hearts to come and nerves them and dilates nor such thy teaching mother of us all not such the trumpet call of thy diviner mood that could thy sons entice from happy homes and toils the fruitful nest of those half virtues which the world calls best into war's tumult rude but rather far that stern device the sponsors chose that round thy cradle stood in the dim unventured wood the veritas that lurks beneath the letter's unprolific sheath life of whate'er makes life worth living seed grain of high emprise immortal food one heavenly thing whereof earth hath the giving three many love truth and lavished life's best oil amidst the dust of books to find her content at last for guerdon of their toil with the cast mantle she had left behind her many in sad faith sought for her many with crossed hands sighed for her but these our brothers fought for her at life's dear peril wrought for her so loved her that they died for her tasting the raptured fleetness of her divine completeness their higher instinct knew those love her best who to themselves are true and what they dared to dream of dared to do they followed her and found her where all may hope to find not in the ashes of the burnt-out mind but beautiful with danger's sweetness round her where faith made whole with deed breathes its awakening breath into the lifeless creed they saw her plumed and mailed with sweet stern face unveiled and all repaying eyes looked proud on them in death four our slender life runs rippling by and glides into the silent hollow of the past what is there that abides to make the next age better for the last is earth too poor to give us something to live for here that shall outlive us some more substantial boon that such as flows and ebbs with fortune's fickle moon the little that we see from doubt is never free the little that we do is but half nobly true with our laborious hiding what men call treasure and the gods call dross life seems a jest of fate's contriving only secure in every one's conniving a long account of nothings paid with loss were we poor puppets jerked by unseen wires after our little hour of strut and rave with all our pasteboard passions and desires loves hates ambitions and immortal fires are tossed pell-mell together in the grave but stay no age was e'er degenerate unless men held it too cheap a rate for in our likeness still we shape our fate ah there is something here unfathomed by the cynic sneer something that gives our feeble light a high immunity from night something that leaps life's narrow bars to claim its birthright with the hosts of heaven a seed of sunshine that doth leaven our earthly dullness with the beams of stars and glorify our clay with light from fountains elder that day a conscience more divine than we a gladness fed with secret tears a vexing forward-reaching sense of some more noble permanence a light across the sea which haunts the soul and will not let it be still glimmering from the heights of undegenerate years five whither leads the path to ampler fates that leads not down through flowery meads to reap an aftermath of youth's vainglorious weeds but up the steep amid the wrath and shock of deadly hostile creeds where the world's best hope and stay by battle's flashes gropes a desperate way and every turf the fierce foot clings to bleeds peace hath her not ignoble wreath ere yet the sharp decisive word light the black lips of cannon 
and the sword dreams in its easeful sheath but some day the live coal behind the thought whether from baal's stone obscene or from the shrine serene of god's pure altar brought bursts up in flame the war of tongue and pen learns with what deadly purpose it was fraught and helpless in the fiery passion caught shakes all the pillared state with shock of men some day the soft ideal that we wooed confronts us fiercely foe beset pursued and cries reproachful was it then my praise and not myself was loved prove now thy truth i claim of thee the promise of thy youth give me thy life or cower in empty phrase the victim of thy genius not its mate life may be given in many ways and loyalty to truth be sealed as bravely in the closet as the field so bountiful is fate but then to stand beside her when craven churls deride her to front a lie in arms and not to yield this shows methinks god's plan and measure of a stalwart man limbed like the old heroic breeds who stands self-poised on manhood's solid earth not forced to frame excuses for his birth fed from within with all the strength he needs six such was he our martyred chief whom late the nation he had led with ashes on her head wept with the passion of an angry grief forgive me if from present things i turn to speak what in my heart will beat and burn and hang my wreath on his world-honoured urn nature they say doth dote and cannot make a man save on some worn-out plan repeating us by rote from him her old world moulds aside she threw and choosing sweet clay from the breast of the unexhausted west with stuff untainted shaped a hero new wise steadfast in the strength of god and true how beautiful to see once more a shepherd of mankind indeed who loved his charge but never loved to lead one whose meek flock the people joyed to be not lured by any cheat of birth but by his clear-grained human worth and brave old wisdom of sincerity they knew that outward grace is dust they could not choose but trust in that sure-footed mind's unfaltering skill and supple tempered will that bent like perfect steel to spring again and thrust he was no lonely mountain peak of mind thrusting to thin air o'er our cloudy bars a sea mark now now lost in vapours blind broad prairie rather genial level lined fruitful and friendly for all humankind yet also nigh to heaven and loved of loftiest stars nothing of europe here or then of europe fronting mournward still ere any names of serf and peer could nature's equal scheme deface and thwart her genial will here was a type of the true elder race and one of plutarch's men talked with us face to face i praise him not it were too late and some in native weakness there must be in him who condescends to victory such as the present gives and cannot wait safe in himself as in a fate so always firmly he he knew to bide his time and can his fame abide still patient in his simple faith sublime till the wise years decide great captains with their guns and drums disturb our judgment for the hour but at last silence comes these all are gone and standing like a tower our children shall behold his fame the kindly earnest brave foreseeing man sagacious patient dreading praise not blame new birth of our new soil the first american seven long as man's hopes insatiate can discern or only guess some more inspiring goal outside of self enduring as the pole along whose course the flying axles burn of spirits bravely pitched earth's manlier brood long as below we cannot find the mead that stills the inexorable mind so long this faith to some ideal good under whatever mortal name it masks freedom law country this ethereal mood that thanks the fates for their severer tasks 
feeling it challenged pulses leap while others sulk in subterfuges cheap and set in danger's van has all the boon it asks shall win man's praise and woman's love shall be a wisdom that we set above all other skills and gifts to culture dear a virtue round whose forehead we enwreath laurels that with a living passion breathe when other crowns grow while we twine them sear what brings us thronging these high rites to pay and seal these hours the noblest of our year save that our brothers found this better way eight we sit here in the promised land that flows with freedom's honey and milk but twas they won it sword in hand making the nettle danger soft for us as silk we welcome back our bravest and our best ah me not all some come not with the rest who went forth brave and bright as any here i strive to mix some gladness with my strain but the sad strings complain and will not please the ear i sweep them for a peon but they wane again and yet again into a dirge and die away in pain in these brave ranks i only see the gaps thinking of dear ones whom the dumb turf wraps dark to the triumph which they died to gain fitlier may others greet the living for me the past is unforgiving i will uncover head salute the sacred dead who went and who return not say not so tis not the grapes of canaan that repay but the high faith that failed not by the way virtue treads paths that end not in the grave no bar of endless night exiles the brave and to the saner mind we rather seem the dead that stayed behind blow trumpets all your exaltations blow for never shall their aureoled presence lack i see them muster in a gleaming row with ever youthful brows that nobler show we find in our dull road their shining track in every nobler mood we feel the orient of their spirit glow part of our unalterable good of all our saintlier aspiration they come transfigured back secure from change in their high-hearted ways beautiful evermore and with the rays of morn on their white shields of expectation nine but is there hope to save even this ethereal essence from the grave whatever scaped oblivion's subtle wrong save a few clarion names or golden threads of song before my musing eye the mighty ones of old sweep by disvoiced now and insubstantial things as noisy once as we poor ghosts of kings shadows of empire wholly gone to dust and many races nameless long ago to darkness driven by that imperious gust of ever rushing time that here doth blow o visionary world condition strange where not abiding is but only change where the deep bolted stars themselves still shift and range shall we to more continuance make pretence renown builds tombs a life estate is wit and bit by bit the cunning years steal all from us but woe leaves are we whose decay no harvest sow but when we vanish hence shall they lie forceless in the dark below save to make green their little length of sods or deepen pansies for a year or two who now to us are shining sweet as gods was dying all they had the skill to do that were not fruitless but the soul resents such short-lived service as if blind events rule without her or earth could so endure she claims a more divine investure of longer tenure than fame's airy rents whate'er she touches doth her nature share her inspiration haunts the unnobled air gives eyes to mountains blind ears to the deaf earth voices to the wind and her clear trump sings succour everywhere by lonely bivouacs to the wakeful mind for soul inherits all that soul could dare yea manhood hath a wider span and larger privilege of life than man the single deed the private sacrifice so radiant now through proudly hidden tears is covered up ere long from mortal eyes with thoughtless drift of the deciduous years but that high privilege that makes all men peers 
that leap of heart whereby a people rise up to a noble anger's height and flamed on by the fates not shrink but grow more bright that swift validity in noble veins of choosing danger and disdaining shame of being set on flame by the pure fire that flies all contact base but wraps its chosen with angelic might these are imperishable gains sure as the sun medicinal as light these hold great futures in their lusty reigns and certify to earth a new imperial race ten who now shall sneer who dare again to say we trace our lines to a plebeian race roundhead and cavalier dumb are those names erewhile in battle loud dream-footed as the shadow of a cloud they flit across the ear that is best blood that hath most iron int to edge resolve with pouring without stint for what makes manhood dear tell us not of plantagenets hapsburgs and guelphs whose thin blood crawls down from some victor in a border brawl how poor their outworn coronets matched with one leaf of that plain civic wreath our brave for honour's blazon shall bequeath through whose desert a rescued nation sets her heel on treason and the trumpet hears shout victory tingling europe's sullen ears with vain resentments and more vain regrets eleven not in anger not in pride pure from passion's mixture rude ever to base earth allied but with far-heard gratitude still with heart and voice renewed to heroes living and dear martyrs dead the strain should close that consecrates our brave lift the heart and lift the head lofty be its mood and grave not without a martial ring not without a prouder tread and a peal of exultation little right has he to sing through whose heart in such an hour beats no march of conscious power sweeps no tumult of elation tis no man we celebrate by his country's victories great a hero half and half the whim of fate but the pith and marrow of a nation drawing force from all her men highest humblest weakest all for her time of need and then pulsing it again through them till the basest can no longer cower feeling his soul spring up divinely tall touched but in passing by her mantle hem come back then noble pride for tis her dower how could poet ever tower if his passions hopes and fears if his triumphs and his tears kept not measure with his people boom cannon boom to all the winds and waves clash out glad bells from every rocking steeple banners advance with triumph bend your staves and from every mountain peak let beacon fire to answering beacon speak katahdin tell monadnock white face he and so leapt on in light from sea to sea till the glad news be sent across a kindling continent making earth feel more firm and air breathe braver be proud for she is saved and all have helped to save her she that lifts up the manhood of the poor she of the open soul and open door with room about her hearth for all mankind the fire is dreadful in her eyes no more from her bold front the helm she doth unbind sends all her handmade armies back to spin and bids her navies that so lately hurled their crashing battle hold their thunders in swimming like birds of calm along the unharmful shore no challenge sends she to the elder world that looked askance and hated a light scorn plays o'er her mouth as round her mighty knees she calls her children back and waits the morn of nobler day enthroned between her subject seas twelve bow down dear land for thou hast found release thy god in these distempered days hath taught thee the sure wisdom of his ways and through thine enemies hath wrought thy peace bow down in prayer and praise no poorest in thy borders but may now lift to the juster skies a man's enfranchised brow o beautiful my country ours once more smoothing thy gold of war dishevelled hair 
or such sweet brows as never other wore and letting thy set lips freed from wrath's pale eclipse rosy edges of their smile lay bare what words divine of lover or of poet could tell our love and make thee know it among the nations bright beyond compare what were our lives without thee what all our lives to save thee we reck not what we gave thee we will not dare to doubt thee but ask whatever else and we will dare End of section 4section five of the vision of sir launfall and other poems by james russell lowell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf on board the seventy six written for mr bryant's seventieth birthday november third eighteen sixty four after the disastrous battle of bull run congress authorized the creation of an army of five hundred thousand and the expenditure of five hundred million dollars the affair of the trent had partially indicated the temper of the english government and the people of the united states were thoroughly roused to a sense of the great task which lay before them mr bryant at this time not only gave strong support to the union through his paper the evening post of new york but wrote two lyrics which had a profound effect one of these entitled not yet was addressed to those of the old world who were secretly or openly desiring the downfall of the republic the other our country's call was a thrilling appeal for recruits it is to this time and these two poems that mr lowell refers in the lines that follow our ship lay tumbling in an angry sea her rudder gone her mainmast o'er the side her scuppers from the waves clutch staggering free trailed threads of priceless crimson through the tide sails shrouds and spars with pirate cannon torn we lay awaiting morn awaiting morn such morn as mocks despair and she that bare the promise of the world within her sides now hopeless helmless bare at random o'er the wildering waters hurled the reek of battle drifting slow a lee not sullener than we morn came at last to peer into our woe when lo a sail now surely help was nigh the red cross flames aloft christ's pledge but no her black guns grinning hate she rushes by and hails us gains the leak ay so we thought sink then with curses fraught i leaned against my gun still angry hot and my lids tingled with the tears held back this scorn methought was crueler than shot the manly death grip in the battle rack yard arm to yard arm were more friendly far than such fear smothered war there our foe wallowed like a wounded brute the fiercer for his hurt what now were best one more tug bravely at the peril's root though death came with it or evade the test if right or wrong in this god's world of ours be leagued with higher powers some faintly loyal felt their pulses lag with the slow beat that doubts and then despairs some caitiff would have struck the starry flag that knits us with our past and makes us heirs of deeds high-hearted as were ever done neath the all-seeing sun but there was one the singer of our crew upon whose head age waved his peaceful sign but whose red heart's blood no surrender knew and couchant under brows of massive line the eyes like guns beneath a parapet watched charged with lightnings yet the voices of the hills did his obey the torrents flashed and tumbled in his song he brought out our native fields from far away or set us mid the innumerable throng of dateless woods or where we heard the calm old homestead's evening psalm but now he sang of faith to things unseen of freedom's birthright given to us in trust and words of doughty cheer he spoke between that made all earthly fortune seem as dust matched with that duty old as time and new of being brave and true we listening learned what makes the might of words manhood to back them constant as a star 
his voice rammed home our cannon edged our swords and sent our boarders shouting shroud and spar heard him and stiffened the sails heard and wooed the winds with loftier mood in our dark hours he manned our guns again remanned ourselves from his own manhood's stores pride honor country throbbed through all his strain and shall we praise god's praise was his before and on our futile laurels he looks down himself our bravest crown end of section five section six of the vision of sir launfall and other poems by james russell lowell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf an indian summer reverie when mr lowell wrote this poem he was living at elmwood in cambridge at that time quite remote from town influences cambridge itself being scarcely more than a village but now rapidly losing its rustic surroundings the charles river flowed near by then a limpid stream untroubled by factories or sewage it is a tidal river and not far from elmwood winds through broad salt marshes mr longfellow's old home is a short stroll nearer town and the two poets exchanged pleasant shots as may be seen by lowell's two h w l and longfellow's the herons of elmwood in under the willows mr lowell has as it were indulged in another reverie at a later period of his life among the same familiar surroundings what visionary tints the year puts on when falling leaves falter through motionless air or numbly cling and shiver to be gone how shimmer the low flats and pastures bare as with her nectar hebe autumn fills the bowl between me and those distant hills and smiles and shakes abroad her misty tremulous hair no more the landscape holds its wealth apart making me poorer in my poverty but mingles with my senses and my heart my own projected spirit seems to me in her own reverie the world to steep tis she that waves to sympathetic sleep moving as she is moved each field and hill and tree how fuse and mix with what unfelt degrees clasped by the faint horizon's languid arms each into each the hazy distances the softened season all the landscape charms those hills my native village that embay in waves of dreamier purple roll away and floating in mirage seem all the glimmering farms far distant sounds the hidden chickadee close at my side far distant sound the leaves the fields seem fields of dream where memory wanders like gleaning ruth and as the sheaves of wheat and barley waver in the eye of boaz as the maiden's glow went by so tremble and seem remote all things the sense receives the cock's shrill trump that tells of scattered corn passed breezily on by all his flapping mates faint and more faint from barn to barn is borne southward perhaps to far magellan straits dimly i catch the throb of distant flails silently overhead the hen-hawk sails with watchful measuring eye and for his quarry waits the sobered robin hunger silent now seeks cedar berries blue his autumn cheer the squirrel on the shingly shagbark's bough now saws now lists with downward eye and ear then drops his nut and with a chipping bound whisks to his winding fastness underground the clouds like swans drift down the streaming atmosphere o'er yon bare knoll the pointed cedar shadows drowse on the crisp gray moss the ploughman's call creeps faint as smoke from black fresh furrowed meadows the single crow a single caw lets fall and all around me every bush and tree says autumn's here and winter soon will be who snows his soft white sleep and silence over all the birch most shy and ladylike of trees her poverty as best she may retrieves and hints at her foregone gentilities with some saved relics of her wreath of leaves 
the swamp oak with his royal purple on glares red as blood across the sinking sun as one who proudlier to a failing fortune cleaves he looks a sachem in his red blanket wrapped who mid some council of the sad garbed whites erect and stern in his own memories lapped with distant eye broods over other sights sees the hushed wood the city's flare replace the wounded turf heal o'er the railway's trace and roams the savage past of his undwindled rights the red oak softer grained yields all for lost and with his crumpled foliage stiff and dry after the first betrayal of the frost rebuffs the kiss of the relenting sky the chestnuts lavish of their long hid gold to the faint summer beggared now and old pour back the sunshine hoarded neath her favoring eye the ash her purple drops forgivingly and sadly breaking not the general hush the maple swamps glow like a sunset sea each leaf a ripple with its separate flush all round the wood's edge creeps the skirting blaze of bushes low as when on cloudy days ere the rain falls the cautious farmer burns his brush or yon low wall which guards one unkempt zone where vines and weeds and scrub oaks intertwine safe from the plough whose rough discordant stone is massed to one soft gray by lichens fine the tangled blackberry crossed and recrossed weaves a prickly network of ensanguined leaves hard by with coral beads the prim black alders shine pillaring with flame this crumbling boundary whose loose blocks topple neath the ploughboy's foot who with each sense shut fast except the eye creeps close and scares the jay he hoped to shoot the woodbine up the elm straight stem aspires coiling it harmless with autumnal fires in the ivy's paler blaze the martyr oak stands mute below the charles a stripe of nether sky now hid by rounded apple trees between whose gaps the misplaced sail sweeps bellying by now flickering golden through a woodland screen then spreading out at his next turn beyond a silver circle like an inland pond slips seaward silently through the marshes purple and green dear marshes vain to him the gift of sight who cannot in their various income share from every season drawn of shade and light who sees in them but levels of brown and bare each change of storm or sunshine scatters free on them its largesse of variety for nature with cheap means still works her wonders rare in spring they lie one broad expanse of green o'er which the light winds run with glimmering feet here yellower stripes track out the creek unseen there darker growths or hidden ditches meet the purpler stains show where the blossoms crowd as if the silent shadow of a cloud hung there becalmed with the next breath to fleet all round upon the river's slippery edge witching to deeper calm the drowsy tide whispers and leans the breeze and tangling sedge through emerald glooms the lingering water slide or sometimes wavering throw back the sun and the stiff banks in eddies melt and run of dimpling light and with the current seem to glide in summer tis a blithesome sight to see as step by step with measured swing they pass the wide-ranked moors wading to the knee their sharp scythes panting through the thick-set grass then stretched beneath a rick shade in a ring their nooning take while one begins to sing a stave that droops and dies neath the close sky of brass meanwhile that devil may care the bobolink remembering duty in mid quaver stops just ere he sweeps o'er rapture's tremulous brink and twixt the windrows most demurely drops a decorous bird of business who provides for his brown mate and fledgling six besides and looks from right to left a farmer mid his crops another change subdues them in the fall but saddens not they still show merrier tints though sober russet seems to cover all 
when the first sunshine through their dewdrop glints look how the yellow clearness streamed across redeems with rarer hues the season's loss as dawn's feet there had touched and left their rosy prints or come when sunset gives its freshened zest lean o'er the bridge and let the ruddy thrill while the shorn sun swells down the hazy west glow opposite the marshes drink their fill and swoon with purple veins then slowly fade through pink to brown as eastward moves the shade lengthening with stealthy creep of simmons darkening hill later and yet ere winter wholly shuts ere through the first dry snow the runner grates and the loath cart-wheel screams in slippery ruts while firmer ice the eager boy awaits trying each buckle and strap beside the fire and until bedtime plays with his desire twenty times putting on and off his new-bought skates then every morn the river's banks shine bright with smooth plate armor treacherous and frail by the frost's clinking hammers forged at night gainst which the lances of the sun prevail giving a pretty emblem of the day when guiltier arms in light shall melt away and stage shall move free-limbed loosed from war's cramping mail and now those waterfalls the ebbing river twice every day creates on either side tinkle as through their fresh sparred grots they shiver in grass arched channels to the sun denied high flaps in sparkling blue the far heard crow the silvered flats gleam frostily below suddenly drops the gull and breaks the glassy tide but crowned in turn by vying seasons three their winter halo hath a fuller ring this glory seems to rest immovably the others were too fleet and vanishing when the hid tide is at its highest flow or marsh and stream one breathless trance of snow with brooding fullness awes and hushes everything the sunshine seems blown off by the bleak wind as pale as formal candles lit by day gropes to the sea the river dumb and blind the brown ricks snow thatched by the storm in play show pearly breakers combing o'er their lee white crests as of some just enchanted sea checked in their maddest leap and hanging poised midway but when the eastern blow with rain aslant from mid-seas prairies green and rolling plains drives in his wallowing herds of billows gaunt and the roused charles remembers in his veins old ocean's blood and snaps his gyves of frost that tyrannous silence on the shores is tossed in dreary wreck and crumbling desolation reigns edgewise or flat in druid-like device with leaden pools between or gullies bare the blocks lie strewn a bleak stonehenge of ice no life no sound to break the grim despair save sullen plunge as through the sedges stiff down crackles riverward some thaw-sapped cliff or when the close wedged fields of ice crunch here and there but let me turn from fancy pictured scenes to that whose pastoral calm before me lies here nothing harsh or rugged intervenes the early evening with her misty dyes smooths off the raveled edges of the nigh relieves the distant with her cooler sky and tones the landscape down and soothes the wearied eyes there gleams my native village dear to me though higher changes waves each day are seen whelming fields famed in boyhood's history sanding with houses the diminished green there in red brick which softening time defies stand square and stiff the muses factories how with my life knit up is every well-known scene flow on dear river not alone you flow to outward sight and through your marshes wind fed from the mystic springs of long ago your twin flows silent through my world of mind grow dim dear marshes in the evening's gray before my inner sight ye stretch away and will forever though these fleshly eyes grow blind beyond the hillock's house bespotted swell where gothic chapels house the horse and chaise 
where quiet kits in grecian temples dwell where coptic tombs resound with prayer and praise where dust and mud the equal year divide there gentle alston lived and wrought and died transfiguring street and shop with his illumined gaze where gilium weedi tantum i have seen but as a boy who looks alike on all that misty hair that fine undine like mien tremulous as down to feeling's faintest call ah dear old homestead counted to thy fame that thither many times the painter came one elm yet bears his name a feathery tree and tall swiftly the present fades in memory's glow our only sure possession is the past the village blacksmith died a month ago and dim to me the forge's roaring blast soon fire new medievals we shall see oust the black smithy from its chestnut tree and that hewn down perhaps the beehive green and vast how many times prouder than king on throne loosed from the village school dames a's and b's panting have i the creaky bellows blown and watched the pent volcano's red increase then paused to see the ponderous sledge brought down by that hard arm voluminous and brown from the white iron swarm its golden vanishing bees dear native town whose choking elms each year with eddying dust before their time turn gray pining for rain to me the dust is dear it glorifies the eve of summer day and when the westering sun half sunken burns the moat thick air to deepest orange turns the westward horseman rides through clouds of gold away so palpable i've seen those unshorn few the six old willows at the causey's end such trees paul potter never dreamed nor drew through this dry mist their checkering shadows send striped here and there with many a long-drawn thread where streamed through leafy chinks the trembling red past which in one bright trail the hangbird's flashes blend yes dearer for thy dust than all that air beneath the awarded crown of victory gilded the blown olympic charioteer though lightly prized the ribbon parchments three yet collegi se you what i am glad that here what colleging was mine i had it linked another tie dear native town with thee nearer art thou than simply native earth my dust with thine concedes a deeper tie a closer claim thy soil may well put forth something of kindred more than sympathy for in thy bounds i reverently laid away that blinding anguish of forsaken clay that title i seem to have in earth and sea and sky that portion of my life more choice to me though brief yet in itself so round and whole than all the imperfect residues can be the artist saw his statue of the soul was perfect so with one regretful stroke the earthen model into fragments broke and without her the impoverished seasons roll end of section six section seven of the vision of sir launfall and other poems by james russell lowell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schampf. the first snowfall the snow had begun in the gloaming and busily all the night had been heaping field and highway with a silence deep and white every pine and fir and hemlock wore ermine too dear for an earl and the porous twig on the elm tree was ridged inch deep with pearl from sheds new roofed with carrera came canticleer's muffled crow the stiff rails were softened to swans down and still fluttered down the snow i stood and watched by the window the noiseless work of the sky and the sudden flurries of snowbirds like brown leaves whirling by i thought of a mound in sweet auburn where a little headstone stood how the flakes were folding it gently as did robins the babes in the wood up spoke our own little mabel saying father who makes it snow and i told her of the good all-father who cares for us here below 
again i looked at the snowfall and thought of the leaden sky that arched o'er our first great sorrow when that mound was heaped so high i remembered the gradual patience that fell from that cloud like snow flake by flake healing and hiding the scar of our deep plunged woe and again to the child i whispered the snow that husheth all darling the merciful father alone can make it fall then with eyes that saw not i kissed her and she kissing back could not know that my kiss was given to her sister folded close under the deepening snow end of section seven Section 8 of The Vision of Sir Launfal and Other Poems by James Russell Lowell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Oak. What gnarled stretch, what depth of shade is his. There needs no crown to mark the forest king. How in his leaves outshines full summer's bliss. Sun, storm, rain, dew to him their tribute bring which he with such benignant royalty accepts as overpayeth what is lent all nature seems his vassal proud to be and cunning only for his ornament how towers he too amid the billowing snows an unquelled exile from the summer's throne whose plain uncinctured front more kingly shows now that the obscuring courtier leaves are flown his boughs make music of the winter air jewelled with sleet like some cathedral front where clinging snowflakes with quaint art repair the dints and furrows of time's envious brunt how doth his patient strength the rude march wind persuade to seem glad breaths of summer breeze and win the soil that would fain be unkind to swell his revenues with proud increase he is the gem and all the landscape wide so doth his grandeur isolate the sense seems but the setting worthless all beside an empty socket were he fallen thence so from oft converse with life's wintry gales should man learn how to clasp with tougher roots the inspiring earth how otherwise avails the leaf creating sap that sunward shoots so every year that falls with noiseless flake should fill old scars up on the stormward side and make hoar age revered for age's sake not for traditions of youth's leafy pride so from the pinched soil of a churlish fate true hearts compel the sap of sturdier growth so between earth and heaven stand simply great that these shall seem but their attendants both for nature's forces with obedient zeal wait on the rooted faith and oaken will as quickly the pretender's cheat they feel and turn mad pucks to flout and mock him still lord all thy works are lessons each contains some emblem of man's all-containing soul shall he make fruitless all thy glorious pains delving within thy grace an eyeless mole make me the least of thy dodona grove cause me some message of thy truth to bring speak but a word to me nor let thy love among my boughs disdain to perch and sing end of section eight section nine of the vision of sir launfal and other poems by james russell lowell this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf prometheus the classic legend of prometheus underwent various changes in successive periods of greek thought in its main outline the story is the same that prometheus whose name signifies forethought stole fire from zeus or jupiter or jove and gave it as a gift to man for this the angry god bound him upon mount caucasus and decreed that a vulture should prey upon his liver destroying every day what was renewed in the night the struggle of man's thought to free itself from the tyranny of fear and superstition and all monsters of the imagination is illustrated in the myth the myth is one which has been a favorite with modern poets as witness gotha shelley mrs browning and longfellow one after one the stars have risen and set 
sparkling upon the hoar-frost on my chain the bear that prowled all night about the fold of the north star has shrunk into his den scared by the blithesome footsteps of the dawn whose blushing smile floods all the orient and now bright lucifer grows less and less into the heaven's blue quiet deep withdrawn sunless and starless all the desert sky arches above me empty as this heart for ages hath been empty of all joy except to brood upon its silent hope as o'er its hope of day the sky doth now all night have i heard voices deeper yet the deep low breathing of the silence grew while all about muffled in awe there stood shadows or forms or both clear felt at heart but when i turned to front them far along only a shudder through the midnight ran and the dense stillness walled me closer round but still i heard them wander up and down that solitude and flappings of dusk wings did mingle with them whether of those hags let slip upon me once from hades deep or of yet dire torments if such be i could but guess and then toward me came a shape as of a woman very pale it was and calm its cold eyes did not move and mine moved not but only stared on them their fixed awe went through my brain like ice a skeleton hand seemed clutching at my heart and a sharp chill as if a dank night fog suddenly closed me in was all i felt and then methought i heard a freezing sigh a long deep shivering sigh as from blue lips stiffening in death close to mine ear i thought some doom was close upon me and i looked and saw the red moon through the heavy mist just setting and it seemed as it were falling or reeling to its fall so dim and dead and palsy struck it looked then all sounds merged into the rising surges of the pines which leagues below me clothing the gaunt loins of ancient caucasus with hairy strength sent up a murmur in the morning wind sad as the wail that from the populous earth all day and night to high olympus soars fit incense to thy wicked throne o jove thy hated name is tossed once more in scorn from off my lips for i will tell thy doom and are these tears nay do not triumph jove they are wrung from me but by the agonies of prophecy like those sparse drops which fall from clouds in travail of the lightning when the great wave of the storm high curled and black rolls steadily onward to its thunderous break why art thou made a god of thou poor type of anger and revenge and cunning force true power was never born of brutish strength nor sweet truth suckled at the shaggy dugs of that old she-wolf are thy thunderbolts that quell the darkness for a space so strong as the prevailing patience of meek light who with the invincible tenderness of peace wins it to be a portion of herself why art thou made a god of thou who hast the never sleeping terror at thy heart that birthright of all tyrants worse to bear than this thy ravening bird on which i smile thou swearest to free me if i will unfold what kind of doom it is whose omen flits across thy heart as o'er a troop of doves the fearful shadow of the kite what need to know that truth whose knowledge cannot save evil its errand hath as well as good when thine is finished thou art known no more there is a higher purity than thou and a higher purity is greater strength thy nature is thy doom at which thy heart trembles behind the thick wall of thy might let man but hope and thou art straightway chilled with thought of that drear silence and deep night which like a dream shall swallow thee and thine let man but will and thou art god no more more capable of ruin than the gold and ivory that image thee on earth he who hurled down the monstrous titan brood blinded with lightnings with rough thunders stunned is weaker than a simple human thought my slender voice can shake thee as the breeze that seems but apt to stir a maiden's hair sways huge oceanus from pole to pole for i am still prometheus and foreknow in my wise heart the end and doom of all yes i am still prometheus 
wiser grown by years of solitude that holds apart the past and future giving the soul room to search into itself and long commune with this eternal silence more a god in my long suffering and strength to meet with equal front the direst shafts of fate than thou in thy faint-hearted despotism girt with thy baby toys of force and wrath yes i am that prometheus who brought down the light to man which thou in selfish fear hadst to thyself usurped his by soul right for man hath right to all save tyranny and which shall free him yet from thy frail throne tyrants are but the spawn of ignorance begotten by the slaves they trample on who could they win a glimmer of the light and see that tyranny is always weakness or fear with its own bosom ill at ease would laugh away in scorn the sand wove chain which their own blindness feigned for adamant wrong ever builds on quicksands but the right to the firm centre lays its moveless base the tyrant trembles if the air but stirs the innocent ringlets of a child's free hair and crouches when the thought of some great spirit with world-wide murmur like a rising gale over men's hearts as over standing corn rushes and bends them to its own strong will so shall some thought of mine yet circle earth and puff away thy crumbling altars jove and wouldst thou know of my supreme revenge poor tyrant even now dethroned in heart realmless in soul as tyrants ever are listen and tell me if this bitter peak this never glutted vulture and these chains shrink not before it for it shall befit a sorrow-taught unconquered titan heart men when their death is on them seem to stand on a precipitous crag that overhangs the abyss of doom and in that depth to see as in a glass the features dim and vast of things to come the shadows as it seems of what had been death ever fronts the wise not fearfully but with clear promises of larger life on whose broad vans upborne their outlook widens and they see beyond the horizon of the present and the past even to the very source and end of things such am i now immortal woe hath made my heart a seer and my soul a judge between the substance and the shadow of truth the sure supremeness of the beautiful by all the martyrdoms made doubly sure of such as i am this is my revenge which of my wrongs builds a triumphal arch through which i see a sceptre and a throne the pipings of glad shepherds on the hills tending the flocks no more to bleed for thee the songs of maidens pressing with white feet the vintage on thy altars poured no more the murmurous bliss of lovers underneath dim grapevine bowers whose rosy bunches press not half so closely their warm cheeks unpaled by thoughts of thy brute lust the hive-like hum of peaceful commonwealths where sunburnt toil reaps for itself the rich earth made its own by its own labour lightened with glad hymns to an omnipotence which thy mad bolts would cope with as a spark with the vast sea even the spirit of free love and peace duty sure recompense through life and death these are such harvests as all master spirits reap haply not on earth but reap no less because the sheaves are bound by hands not theirs these are the bloodless daggers wherewithal they stab fallen tyrants this their high revenge for their best part of life on earth is when long after death prisoned and pent no more their thoughts their wild dreams even have become part of the necessary air men breathe when like the moon herself behind a cloud they shed down light before us on life's sea that cheers us to steer onward still in hope earth with her twining memories ivies o'er their holy sepulchres the chainless sea in tempest or wide calm repeats their thoughts the lightning and the thunder all free things have legends of them for the ears of men all other glories are as falling stars but universal nature watches theirs such strength is won by love of humankind not that i feel that hunger after fame which souls of a half greatness are beset with but that the memory of noble deeds cries shame upon the idle and the vile 
and keeps the heart of man forever up to the heroic level of old time to be forgot at first is little pain to a heart conscious of such high intent as must be deathless on the lips of men but having been a name to sink and be a something which the world can do without which having been or not would never change the lightest pulse of fate this is indeed a cup of bitterness the worst to taste and this thy heart shall empty to the dregs endless despair shall be thy caucasus and memory thy vulture thou wilt find oblivion far lonelier than this peak behold thy destiny thou think'st it much that i should brave thee miserable god but i have braved a mightier than thou even the tempting of this soaring heart which might have made me scarcely less than thou a god among my brethren weak and blind scarce less than thou a pitiable thing to be downtrodden into darkness soon but now i am above thee for thou art the bungling workmanship of fear the block that awes the swart barbarian but i am what myself have made a nature wise with finding in itself the types of all with watching from the dim verge of the time what things are to be visible in the gleams thrown forward on them from the luminous past wise with the history of its own frail heart with reverence and with sorrow and with love broad as the world for freedom and for man thou in all thy strength shall crumble except love by whom and for whose glory ye shall cease and when thou art but a dim moaning heard from out the pitiless gloom of chaos i shall be a power and a memory a name to fright all tyrants with a light unsettling as the pole star a great voice heard in the breathless pause of the fight by truth and freedom ever waged with wrong clear as a silver trumpet to awake huge echoes that from age to age live on in kindred spirits giving them a sense of boundless power from boundless suffering wrung and many a glazing eye shall smile to see the memory of my triumph for to meet wrong with endurance and to overcome the present with a heart that looks beyond are triumph like a prophet eagle perch upon the sacred banner of the right evil springs up and flowers and bears no seed and feeds the green earth with its swift decay leaving it richer for the growth of truth but good once put in action or in thought like a strong oak doth from its boughs shed down the ripe germs of a forest thou weak god shall fade and be forgotten but this soul fresh living still in the serene abyss in every heaving shall partake that grows from heart to heart among the sons of men as the ominous hum before the earthquake runs far through the aegean from roused isle to isle foreboding wreck to palaces and shrines and mighty rents in many a cavernous air that darkens the free light to man this heart unscarred by thy grim vulture as the truth grows but more lovely neath the beaks and claws of harpies blind that fain would soil it shall in all the throbbing exaltations share that wait on freedom's triumphs and in all the glorious agonies of martyr spirits sharp lightning throws to split the jagged clouds that veil the future showing them the end pain's thorny crown for constancy and truth girding the temples like a wreath of stars this is a thought that like the fabled laurel makes my faith thunderproof and thy dread bolts fall on me like the silent flakes of snow on the hoar brows of aged caucasus but o oh, thought far more blissful they can rend this cloud of flesh and make my soul a star unleash thy crouching thunders now o oh jove free this high heart which a poor captive long doth knock to be let forth this heart which still in its invincible manhood overtops thy puny godship as this mountain doth the pines that moss its roots oh even now while from my peak of suffering i look down beholding with a far-spread gush of hope the sunrise of that beauty in whose face shone all around with love no man shall look but straightway like a god he is uplift unto the throne long empty for his sake and clearly oft foreshadowed in wide dreams by his free inward nature 
which nor thou nor any anarch after thee can bind from working its great doom now now set free this essence not to die but to become part of that awful presence which doth haunt the palaces of tyrants to hunt off with its grim eyes and fearful whisperings and hideous sense of utter loneliness all hope of safety all desire of peace all but the loathed forefeeling of blank death part of that spirit which doth ever brood in patient calm on the unpilfered nest of man's deep heart till mighty thoughts grow fledged to sail with darkening shadow o'er the world filling with dread such souls as dare not trust in the unfailing energy of good until they swoop and their pale quarry make of some o'er bloated wrong that spirit which scatters great hopes in the seed field of man like acorns among grain to grow and be a roof for freedom in all coming time but no this cannot be for ages yet in solitude unbroken shall i hear the angry caspian to the euxine shout and euxine answer with a muffled roar on either side storming the great walls of caucasus with leagues of climbing foam less from my height than flakes of downy snow that draw back baffled but to hurl again snatched up in wrath and horrible turmoil mountain on mountain as the titans erst my brethren scaling the high seat of jove heaved pelion upon ossa's shoulders broad in vain emprise the moon will come and go with her monotonous vicissitude once beautiful when i was free to walk among my fellows and to interchange the influence benign of loving eyes but now by aged use grown wearisome false thought most false for how could i endure these crawling creatures of lonely woe unshamed by weak complaining but for thee loneliest save me of all created things mild-eyed astarte my best comforter with thy pale smile of sad benignity year after year will pass away and seem to me in mine eternal agony but as the shadows of dumb summer clouds which i have watched so often darkening o'er the vast sarmatian plain league wide at first but with still swiftness lessening on and on till cloud and shadow meet and mingle where the gray horizon fades into the sky far far to northward yes for ages yet must i lie here upon my altar huge a sacrifice for man sorrow will be as it hath been his portion endless doom while the immortal with the mortal linked dreams of its wings and pines for what it dreams with upward yearn unceasing better so for wisdom is meek sorrow's patient child and empire over self and all the deep strong charities that make men seem like gods and love that makes them be gods from her breast sucks in the milk that makes mankind one blood good never comes unmixed or so it seems having two faces as some images are carved of foolish gods one face is ill but one heart lies beneath and that is good as are all hearts when we explore their depths therefore great heart bear up thou art but type of what all lofty spirits endure that fain would win men back to strength and peace through love each hath his lonely peak and on each heart envy or scorn or hatred tears life long with vulture beak yet the high soul is left and faith which is but hope grown wise and love and patience which at last shall overcome end of section nine